So now I'm recording, but we're not recording anything, just our voices. And I have to say, this is Erica Brown. It is April 30th, 2013, and I'm interviewing Sarah Duckett, who lives on Fenton Street, and we're outside on her back porch, and it's nice and sunny out. Um, Sarah, can you tell us how you came to Hopkinton? Well, this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, it was 1976. Frank and I were living in an apartment behind the state prison in Framingham. And uh, General Motors uh, announced that at least three quarters of that housing had to go to workers who were going to work in the, in the plant. And pretty soon the neighborhood got a little iffy. So we started looking for a house. And we went to a realtor who said basically... You can't afford anything that starts with an S or a W. Like Sudbury, Southboro, Wayland, Wellesley, you know. So he took us to one house in Holliston and this house in Hopkinton. <clears throat> um, this was no great shakes <laughs> house when we saw it, but we could afford it. I love the way it sat on the property that gave us a huge side yard. It had a great pantry, um, so we did it, <laughs> and that began the first of many years of ripping it to shreds. <laughs> <clears throat> when we bought it, the entire the entire house had dark paneling in it. There were no overhead lights; they were just little, you know, lights on a table. So you were stumbling around all the time because you couldn't find anything. So <clears throat> the first thing was the kitchen. And I do have pictures of Frank's parents with us ripping out the kitchen and all the horsehair plaster. And how old is the house? House is about 1850, 1855. And uh, in many ways, they, uh, they did a nice job. But in other ways, it was really half-assed. <laughs> You know, I mean, we were taking out walls, and we would have um, what are those things that go down slats yeah. that stopped halfway. You know, it was just like anyway. It took us, I would say, because we kept running out of money, um, a good fifteen years to get all of the rooms ripped out. And we actually, we still do have a little closet area that's over the stairs that still has horsehair plaster in it. Um, I said, gee, Frank, don't you think we ought to clean this up too? And he said, eh. <laughs> it's a sign. It's history. Shall I leave it there? It's history. Um, and we have been here ever since. So we've been here 37 years in September. And we just fell in love with the town. <clears throat> the um, town back then was only about 6,500 people. Uh, the cars you saw around town were, a lot of them were pickups with, with guns, gun, gun racks across them, or inexpensive cars, uh, a far cry from what it is what you see downtown now. Uh, Brown and Smith's, which is now Bill's Pizza, was sort of the hangout. And uh, he sold, he sold magazines and newspapers, and he had a big, wonderful counter that kind of went in and out and in and out like this, so everybody could sort of talk with everybody else while they were sitting there. Did you have kids yet? No, no. The first kid. Uh, well, wait a minute. What year am I? In 1980, Brendan was born. Um, in December. In 1983, Brendan and Frank and I went to Beijing for a year. He was working for Thermo Electron. They were installing uh, computerized uh, sites or trailers, nine of them around the city of Beijing to measure air pollution. So he was in charge of that whole thing, and I got a job teaching English at uh, the Tung Dasha, which is uh, the Engineers College, they called it. Anyway, um, 
my kids in the kids <laughs> in the class were between 19 and 29 because they had all lost 10 years during the Cultural Revolution mm. during their education process. Um, so it was it was it was a challenge, especially with the books they gave me that I was supposed to use to teach them English. It was uh, there were five of them, and they were all about things like where to go on a date in New York City. Now I ask you, what is someone who's been sitting out in a commune for ten years going to know about dating in New York City? So I am. Um, I told Professor Tang, who was my head on show, that um, they just, they weren't going to work. <laughs> no way were they going to work. So uh, I had, um, I asked for newspapers from America and uh, magazines and the Florence Burke, who worked with uh, Frank at Thermo, boxed all this stuff up and sent all this stuff over. But until it got there, uh, I just had to kind of wing it. And um, there are certain uh, phrases that aren't um, understood over there, like yesterday, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. So I brought in all Brendan's little Sesame Street toys, and I would put them up on the, bull the chalkboard, and we would talk about who is in front of who, and who was behind who, and all this kind of stuff, which helped a lot. And um, they weren't supposed to—they weren't supposed to make any mistakes because that would reflect badly on me. They would be causing me to lose face. This was a—this still is a difficult concept to deal with. So, the only way I could really get through to them, to, you know, to get them to say, "Okay, talk to me." I don't care what it sounds like. Just so eventually, we broke them all in. At the end of um, well, there was this one kid who was trying to talk to me in English, and all of a sudden he goes "nigga," and I just looked at him and I said "nigga." That's like saying "um," you know. Oh, <laughs> oh god! <laughs> and everybody cracked up, and that really broke the ice for a lot of kids. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, then when it came time for a final exam, you know, Professor Tang comes in and says, you must give them a written test. I said, why am I giving them a written test when this was a class in oral English? So he said, well, you have to do something. We have to have grades for them. So I took in our little tape recorder and a whole mess of tapes and their assignment was to come up with a three-minute speech each that they would tape in class and then we would all listen to it and critique it and whatnot. And that worked great. In fact, I still have the tapes upstairs oh, wow. in my room. <laughs> anyway, that satisfied Professor Tang. And uh, I really loved it. Did you uh, want to stay? I I probably would have wanted to stay um, teaching for another mm -hmm. year, but Frank's job was done. Mm -hmm. Who was was this empty? No, we rented it, gotcha. or actually Mike McBride rented it for us, and uh, we had a lawyer who took care of all the bills and all. So and and Frank's mother took the cat. <laughs> so. <clears throat> We came home in August of 84. We, were, we had contemplating going um, on the Siberian Express up into Moscow from China. And then we figured, well, it's just going to take too damn long. So we ended up flying, but we flew from east to west. So we went and we stopped in Switzerland, and then we stopped in England. And then we got home. And so Brendan was three and a half years old at this point, and he had a great time. He had friends over there, uh, all different nationalities, and they would all get together, and they formed their own language. 
No one else knew what they were talking about, but they all knew what they were talking about. You know, we had Chinese, German, English, French, Australian. And he, uh, we sent him to a, um, well, I sent him to a daycare at the hotel, the Yoya Bing one, which housed the, um, the kids of the, the Fuyua, the workers. And so we took him there, and, and as you can probably imagine, he was three years old. He walked in, and he saw all these kids sitting at little tables, finishing up their lunch, and they all picked up their bowls and spoons and put them inside the big bowl. Then they all picked up their chairs and put them against the wall, and they all sat down very calmly around the wall. Three-year-olds. Three-year-olds, and then Brendan ran around like an airplane. I can't tell you how happy all those teachers were when we pulled him out of the school. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody came outside to wave goodbye. <laughs> Sai Tian, Sai Tian. <laughs> then I got a, a, actually a girl from Connecticut who lived in the same building as ours to uh, babysit him while I went and did teaching. And then I also did some... Um, editing work for a, a film studio. Um, I guess that's all I did. Anyway, we came home, and I can remember the first time I walked into Kalala's, and I just turned right around and walked out. I just could not begin to fathom all of the cereal in one row like that. <laughs> because we had lived for a year with you know, you just get what you need every day kind of stuff. It was like reentry. It was, it was awful. And my brother had died right before we left for China in 83. And I had never grieved. Hmm. So that hit me too when we came back. And I was a mess. Um, I did get back on the finance committee. I had been on it uh, and began in 79. And that kind of helped me um, get more of a grasp <laughs> reality in this country that's the mailman yeah. and I am um, I am still blown away by the amount of excess in this country things people don't need collect dust I mean, it's just it still blows me away, even after we've been home almost 30 years. It just, it really... So when I go to the cereal aisle now, I'm going for one kind of cereal, I just walk in, I grab the All Brand, and I leave. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll see, you wanted to know a little bit about Hopkinton back in the, what, the 80s? Yeah, like when you got back, what, you know, you, what were you doing? Well, I would say that that year was the first year they did have sort of a mini building boom. So when we came back, it was really the first time I noticed any them and us kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, more expensive homes. Of course, at that point, now bear in mind, it was 1984, so they were $275,000, but that was a hell of a lot of money back then. Mm. What did you pay for this house, you mind I ask? 349 um, so we did notice that, and when the kids got into school, well, when Mark, uh, Brendan got into school, um, you know, he would go to somebody's house and would say, well, why don't we have this or that? And I said, well, because we can't afford it. Isn't it nice you have a friend's house that you can go to and do it there? Um, he was great in school. At that point, center school was grades, um, K, 1, 2, and 3. Um, and Elmwood was four, five, and six. And while he was in the third grade, they started doing the first addition to center school. So he never got to experience any of it. When he got to Elmwood, when he left the sixth grade, they were putting the extension on the Elmwood school. <laughs> there was no Hopkins school. At that point, it was junior high, which was part of the now middle I just got the papers. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yep. Hi. <laughs> Hi. 
Don delivers the papers for me. Okay. Um, I could forget where I was. <clears throat> you would tell me about the school. Oh, there was no the middle school. Yeah, there was no middle school as such. It was junior high school, and then which was seven and eight, and then high school, nine through twelve, all in the same building. But it wasn't at the high school that we have now. No, yeah. no, no. Um, in fact, they were building the high school we have now when Brendan left <laughs> that high school. <laughs> Poor kid, never got to see anything new. Um, well. Tell me how you got into the papers. Like, what? Oh, God, that was, that was just a few years ago. Oh. We adopted the kids in 83, uh, 86. Brendan was six years old. Um, they're both from Korea. Uh, he was wonderful with them for about the first three or four weeks. And then it dawned on him that they weren't leaving. <laughs> but he adjusted, and he and Mark are just absolutely closer than close. Mark was his best man at Brendan's wedding. Um, I started a long ordeal with Amy in school because she had uh, learning problems, uh, what they called auditory discrimination, which basically meant if you said a sentence to her, she could only pick two or three words out of it, hmm. and then she would make up her own meaning to go with that sentence. So she was always responding to people in total non sequiturs. So it was that and attention deficit which in apparently girls' cases is not a hyper thing. It's just, uh, this was a point where um, I had looked into her eyes and literally there was nobody home. I mean, just absolute vacant. I take, took her to a child psychologist at one point and while she was talking with her, I was out in the other room. She told me later that during the conversation, Amy just spaced out and said, look at that purple butterfly over there. But there wasn't any purple butterfly. It was, so, the special ed program back then was nowhere near as good as it is now. I had to fight every single year to get her attention. Um, somehow they never managed to pass her records on to the next class. And I'd say the best teacher she had was second grade was Betty Casey. She actually called me in before school started. I had I sent her everything we had had tested at Beth at uh, Leahy Clinic and uh, the child psychologist, and so she and I talked, worked together. She had a place. Uh, Amy was going to sit in a specific spot because one ear was better than the other. She used to have a little notebook that she wrote everything down in um, because she would have to continually be reminded over and over. She'd have to sort of be pre-taught and then taught and then after taught oh my gosh. kind of thing. Well, needless to say, Amy didn't like that part very much. In fact, it, it caused no end of problems with the schools. You know, at, at one point I got a, a note back in fifth grade saying, Amy was supposed to have taken this math test home and corrected her mistakes. She brought it back again, uncorrected. And I wrote back this note saying, you know, I told you that she wasn't going to understand unless you made sure you said it two or three times or wrote it down. She's not being nasty to you. She just didn't know what to do. Believe it or not, after that teacher retired a few years ago, she actually apologized to me. Oh, wow. Not that it helped Amy any. Anyway, um, where am I? Oh, I guess we're still in the 80s. Well, I was, I was on the finance committee all the way till 1991. I was chairman for two years. Uh, everything uh, back then was really done on paper. <laughs> uh, we started having uh, a computerized you know, those big, long sheets of paper, the dot matrix right. stuff. Um, about the time I left, I, I left because I think when people are in a position for 
X number of years, I think they get myopic. And they tend to see what they want to see and not what everything's out there. So I left. And then I felt really weird because that sort of had been my identity. I took a whole bunch of part-time jobs. <laughs> I worked at Colella's as a cashier two or three times. I worked for Margot Roman as a vet tech. I worked at an executive suite place where I did, uh, you know, bookkeeping and filing and all. All because they had mom's hours so that I could be home with the kids. And um, I'm always, I'm so glad I was always home with the kids. Really helped a lot. Especially when uh, Mark and Amy got older and the town went through its second building stage, beginning of the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it wasn't the beginning of the 90s. Anyway. How long did you work at Colella's? Well, the first time I worked at Colella's was before I got pregnant with Brendan. And I was the first one actually to leave Colella's pregnant. <laughs> the second time I left was when Frank's mother was here with us and um, she was dying and I needed to be home. Uh, that's also the first time I ever missed town meeting <laughs> was when she was with us. Of course, no, I'm sorry. I missed it the year we were in China, obviously. <clears throat> um, then I worked at Colella's. Uh, I went back a third time. <clears throat> but I didn't last very long, and I can't, can't remember why right now. But when I first started working there, it was, it was, it was the old store. It was uh, the old wooden floors, which were uneven. Um, I worked mostly at the back of the store, which is now, uh, uh, I don't know if they call it the back or the front anymore. It's the one on Main Street. Mm -hmm. uh, the cash registers were the old punch in the numbers and pull the crank or punch in the numbers and push in the whatever it was. And every time those doors open, we all froze our little butts off at that end. It, that's where they had the, the, the courtesy booth was at that end. So it was Pat Schofield and Betty Foy and me. We all worked up there together and joked and laughed and had a great time. Consequently, I, I met an awful lot of people in town, which I think helped when this idea of the newspaper came around. Um, we had had the crier. It had been uh, originally put out by the Hopkinton Women's Club then it was bought by, um, I can't remember his name, but he was in Sudbury. And he made it into a tab, like it is now. And he ran it for quite a few years. Marie Eldridge wrote for him. Uh, Perry Fitzpatrick. Um, and it was great. But then he got to the point where he wanted to go down on the Cape and do something else. So he made the horrible mistake of selling it to Community News. Mm -hmm. At which point, the crier was no longer the crier that everyone had come to expect. So I think it was probably over the next year I would see more, pe more and more people in Colella's or in the drugstore, in the library, saying, why can't we have a newspaper back again? This is just like reading the Metro Daily News. So... Um, my dear friend Rob Phipps <laughs> sort of kicked me in the butt and said, Sarah, if anybody can do this, you can. So we had a little mini meeting. Uh, Perry Fitzpatrick, who actually became our guru because he really was a journalist. And uh, uh, Rob and Lisa Colgan at that point, who was going to do some advertising stuff. So the first step was we went out and saw Al Holman, who ran a similar paper and runs uh, the Mendon Upton Crier, and he now runs also the Milford Crier, Town Crier. Um, and he, Frank and I went out, and he sat us down, and he, he explained how they got started and what things he recommended that we do. He said there should be one person who would be the... Uh, The be all and end all, I guess. Okay. The Somebody that uh -huh. everybody sort of knew and trusted. 
Um, and he said that might have that would be me because of the years in town, the years on the finance committee. And then he talked about how to go about doing um, the layout and all this kind of stuff. So the first thing I did <coughs> after Brendan and Amy and Mark put together my desk. <laughs> how old were they? Well, Brennan was still home. Oh, well, this was 2000. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I bought a huge printer because it took 11 by 17 paper. And I put together my first issue uh, just on that in black and white. And I went to a Chamber of Commerce meeting. Uh, and I showed it to people there because obviously I needed support. And uh, my biggest... Um, supporter there was Hank Fredette, who once was a cop and was now, at, well, then the head of the water department. And uh, he was a big supporter, and Jimmy Pine. Um, honestly, I can't even remember who else was there right now. Isn't that terrible? Anyhow, I got some ads. I went out to um, Saltus Press, which no longer exists, unfortunately, after 108 years. Wow. Um, and I met with the pre-press people because they're the ones that I would be dealing with. And back then, I had to actually put it on a floppy disk and take it out there. Before that, I mean, they had just gotten to that point. Before that, people actually took out boards, big, huge boards, you know, where everything's been set in and all. So thankfully, I managed to get to the next stage. Of course, I knew nothing about the computer. <laughs> Thank you, children. <laughs> Mark, help me. <laughs> um, and, and really nothing about putting a newspaper together. <laughs> so uh, the first few were, um, you know, really sad. <laughs> but Do you have any copies of the first couple? Oh, yeah, actually, I have copies of everything in the barn. Yeah. In fact, it's probably a huge fire hazard. Um, I got better. Uh, Kathy Peach, who used to live in town, helped me a lot on how to use the computer, besides my kids. Um, and then when I got into the uh, InDesign program, which is what we, we use now, uh, that, was, that was obviously different. And then we got to the point where um, I, could, I could send it electronically to them. But invariably, there was always an error. <laughs> so then I would have to take out <laughs> my hard copies again. I always printed the hard copies out so that they could see it. We didn't, we didn't do color back then. It was all I could master was black and white. And... Um, George Coteau, who was the pre-press guy out there, was absolutely heaven sent. He would sit with me and sit with me and sit with me and say, okay, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Mm -hmm. They got me through so many screw-ups, I can't tell you. Um, however, they went out of business, unfortunately. So I am now with I am now with uh, Graphic Developments, and they're down in Hanover, Mass. You can't get there from here. I know because I actually went down and looked at the place and uh, the most bizarre directions to get there. It, you, it's not direct at all. Anyway, I don't have to do that because <laughs> I can do it all electronically. <clears throat> and I no longer have to um, do any hard copies if there's an issue it's usually because I have neglected to tell them how many flats were color and which flats they were. But I'm doing a lot better on that now. Now uh, we're getting people trained to either bring their inserts to me two weeks earlier than they want them in or to ship them down to GDI because uh, when the driver drops off my papers he picks up any inserts that are going to go in for the next issue, mm. which saves everybody a trip and me $100. So we're getting them trained. Um, I have been blessed with incredible staff people over the, 
almost 14 years. I've had a couple of faux pas, but they left after being requested to leave because you had to buy into the philosophy of the paper. We, we were, we're not, I mean, yeah, I had to make some money, but we were more in it for the town. And um, so there were only a couple people who didn't quite get that. Um, but they're gone, and I've just, I've been so lucky. People just popped out of the blue. Um, Christy Maloney, mm -hmm. I was so sad when she left. <laughs> But I've sort of become the um, the stepping stone onto other real jobs. <laughs> and what's fun is I used to have students come in. And uh, uh, first one was Debbie White. She was in Amy's class. And she did her senior project, the newspaper. And she did, her project was the final paper that got done that time. And after that, I... Um, uh, Erica Hendry, who went on to Ithaca as the um, editor of their publisher of their newspaper, and she went to the National Geographic. I think she's still National Geographic, but she's doing web stuff. Um, Camille, Camille. Oh. I can't remember his first name. Last name was Camille. He uh, went from me to the Boston Globe sports section. I don't know if he's still there. And then Erica Steele, who also wrote for me, uh, is back writing for me again. Because she, that's what she wanted to do. She always wanted to write. And she's gotten herself a new job. And she's got lots of time. And she it just does an incredible job. And she's sort of building up a portfolio, and that's great. Uh... Of course, there's you, and Jean is just invaluable. <laughs> Every once in a while, she says, can I please write something besides sports? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we have the Jean Can issue, <laughs> which is the marathon issue every year. She, she got a nice check for that one. It's okay. Um, Nancy Cavanaugh came around because Lynn Calkins, who does the police log, knew Nancy, and Nancy wanted to write. So, I mean, it's been more word of mouth. I've only had to put an ad in, I think, once, and I did get some um, re uh, resumes back, but when I talked to people, you know, they found out it, it wasn't a real job. <laughs> um, said thanks, but no thanks, so... I've um, been blessed to have all these moms who love the town, love their kids, want to see the kids in the paper, um, and want to do the best for the town. And I've just, I've been so lucky. I really have. It's fun. What's, what do you think is the, the biggest story you've had to cover in the past almost 14 years? Oh, God. Most. Well, well, biggest controversial I, or I, difficult. I started after the exodus to Holliston, so I, I didn't, I wasn't weighing in on that one. Um, town meetings, I would say the Fruit Street stuff, uh, which went on for almost 10 years, <laughs> and is still going on. Um, this last one, after the bombing, this was really tough to put together. As I mentioned to you earlier, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be respectful but not maudlin, and, and it was it was it was tough trying to keep it on a high note, mm -hmm. um, but without losing perspective. Do you have like a set of, you know, being part of the town and on the finance committee? Do you have kind of like a bylaw for yourself of how to, to cover things, to keep it balanced, or to, like, what do you... I have a little notebook <laughs> that I write in because I'm still not totally computerized. <laughs> I write down people's names. Everybody sort of already sort of has their own area of interest. Um, but I keep a list, and as things come into me, 
uh, via email, you know, ideas for stories or whatnot. Um, I decide who's best suited for that kind of story, and I send it off, and they either say yay or nay, and then I write it on my little list. And I keep the list all the way up until the time of um, the deadline, which is supposed to be Tuesday, somehow ends up Thursday. Sometimes I don't get things until Sunday morning. But anyway, it all comes together. <laughs> because I kind of work it all out in my head before I ever get down to the computer and sitting there. And um, The hardest part is the front page what I'm going to highlight. I try and keep what I call the hard news in the first three or four pages of the paper. Um, I mean, there's a lot of community information and all that, that's all through it and, and people who've made honor roll and sports honors and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, I'm serious about keeping hard news in the paper because everybody gets it. Hopefully they read it, uh, so they have some inkling of what's going on in their town where they actually have a say at town meeting what goes on in their town. So, you know, you can lead a horse to water and all that, so I don't really know how many people actually read things. Um, I know that my husband doesn't. <laughs> This is such a hoot, because you'll ask me something, and I'll say, Frank, it was in the last issue. <laughs> Frank, you never read the paper. Oh, well, I watch it while you're putting it together. But you're not reading it. Anyway, I'm sure there are a lot of other people out there just like that. <laughs> so it would be really nice if they would read it, because we spend a lot of time, all of us, on getting things right. Uh, walking down the middle of a story. We try not to be on one side or another of anything. Uh, we don't endorse people um, or ideas or articles because we're, our job is to inform everybody and there to make up their own decisions. How do you deal with <clears throat> um, praise or criticism from different areas of the community, you know, like... Um yeah. I, I usually only get criticism. <laughs> what do you get criticized I, about? Oh, let's see. The last one was an anonymous scrawl on a piece of lined white paper criticizing how awful the paper is in its grammatical punctuation and syntax. But she wasn't surprised that it was in the marathon issue because it's in every other issue. Of course, she did not leave her name. Um, I'm assuming it's a she, I don't know. She didn't leave her name, or I would have called her and said, hey, you want a proofreading job? <laughs> However, I don't respond. Well, I can't respond to anonymous things. I don't print anonymous things. Um, I think I did once when I first started, and it was a letter from the first grade teachers, and I got blasted by a certain person for that. Anyway, I don't print or not. Um, I get a lot of complaints via email about something I did or didn't do, or um, I sent you a correction, but you didn't put the correction in. Um, it, you know, it's usually people who are upset about one thing or another. Um, I've gotten a couple of really nice praise ones. One was for Kathy Boudet, who did the the history story in Orochini. Uh, I sent that on to her because the, the, guy, the guy who wrote it, um, I think, wants to talk to her and, and do some more research up there. Um, I've gotten a couple for your stories that I've sent on to you. I, I thank the people and I tell them that I have sent it on to whoever it came from. And um, Jean, of course, has gotten... Thousands. Yeah. How do you, um, being a member of the community and, you know, taking the criticism and the praise, um, stay at it? You mean keep doing the newspaper? Keep doing the newspaper and, you know, um, stay on your course and not let it 
detractor. Well, I put that into Perry. Perry Fitzpatrick worked for the um, Framingham News, Middlesex News, New Jersey, whatever it was back then. Um, he gave me the AP book. Said you got to you got to be consistent. I don't care if you do it this way or that way, but you got to be consistent. Uh, that was a biggie. And then uh, when we first started meeting, heading ed, ed meetings at his house, um, we would sit there and we would go through the paper, all of us together. And he would explain things and whatnot. And if I told him something, uh, you know, oh, Perry, what you wrote in your Periscope column there, it's going to come back and bite you. And he said, good, because that's the point. They're reading it. I guess that is true. You do hear when, you know, yeah. if, it, if you get someone's attention, then you, you've yeah. done the job. And then you've, then you've started a discussion, hopefully. It's just that a few times that I have responded like that, uh, as an editorial, I've never gotten anything back again. Which is a little disappointing. It really is. Because, what's the point? Right. So I've heard stories, knowing you for a long time, that um, your presence... Like you're you you are actually able to intimidate people. I've heard that you intimidate Norman. What do you think about that? I do. <laughs> actually, I haven't even laid eyes on Norman in months. <laughs> but meaning like, like you can get stuff done. Oh, well, that's when I was a library trustee. Um, before the town took it over, and we were negotiating all of this stuff. Yeah, I would be in his office periodically, and. He, uh, what's her name, Mary Rose, who used to be here as H HR at that point, somehow always se seemed to feel that it was her responsibility to be in there, too. So I would kick her out. Um, she sent me, at one point, a scathing email about something, and I sent it to Norman. I said, uh, hello, is this from you? Um, I was very upset about it, and he did talk to her, and... But, um, I don't know, I just say things the, the way they are. And that library thing was getting so messed up. And we kept having conflicting reports from... This from was about the... The, the town taking it over uh -huh. and the Nine Church Street building. And anyway, it went back and forth and back and forth. Uh, Brian Herr was our liaison when we really got into it. Then Ben Polico took over, so I would hear some things from Ben, and I would hear something else from Norman, and they contradicted each other. Sometimes I would hear things from Norman that contradicted what he said before. It just, I can't, I can't do things like that. To me, you just go in, you do the job, and you get out. So, uh, I, don't, I didn't know I intimidated him. I think that's funny. <laughs> I like Norman. Oh, I know. Yeah, and he likes you too. I just whenever I when I talk to to Tim and he says I need to get something done, he'll say, "Call Sarah. Have him call." <laughs> <laughs> what a hoot! <laughs> oh God! Fun. So, what was your most rewarding issue besides the you know the first one that you got done and started off? The most rewarding issue of the paper or the yeah. most? Oh, okay. Oh God. That's a long time, Erica. Come on. I know. Well, well um, yes, the most rewarding issue of the paper. Let's do it that way. The most, the, the thing that you covered that you were most proud of. <clears throat> do you have a favorite paper? A favorite one of a favorite well I'd have to say the ones where actually where we lost lost people um, people who've been in town a long time and um, that we wrote editorials about because um, I always thought it was important that the people who were there now know who came before them and what they did um, did you ever write about you've written a couple of those yeah. Yeah. I wrote one about Hank. Um, How was it to write, uh, write about him? 
Oh, I loved Hank. He was just such an incredible person. Besides being a super cop for a while. And uh, he was on the youth commission, the original youth commission. Um, and they named the skate park after him. And the water superintendent, he also trained dogs. He had a canine dog for when he was with the police. And so he took, took pity on me and took my dogs. <laughs> And he, he was just great. He would just walk around and go, they're not wagging their tails because they're happy with you. They're sniffing things. <laughs> Remember, this is a dog, not a person. <laughs> I mean, he didn't know golden retrievers are, pe are people. <laughs> I agree. Anyway, then let's see, we wrote one when Perry died. Oh, that was so sad. Um, they had moved, uh, Perry and his wife had moved down to... Um, one of those Sun City places in North, South North Carolina, and actually Frank and I drove down there once and went and saw them. And all. Um, he uh, Perry, <laughs> they were right on this. There were all these lagoons going all the way through this place. He had a an, uh, an alligator that would come up out of the water and sun itself on his lawn, and he called him. Bob. Is it, that where you got the name for the dog? No, no. The name for the dog came from the girls who, whose father sold me the dog. They said they always wanted to have a dog named Bob, and would I please keep the name? So I did. And let's see, I wrote one on... Um, Don't think I did one on Joe Pratt. I can't remember. That's what getting old does to you. Mm -hmm. Well, thinking of from when you first got here to how the town is now. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. What are you, um, what do you think is good and what do you think is bad? Hmm. Um, it's good that the schools have been so strengthened after that Holliston exodus. I mean, that started it, but it, every year they seem to get better and better, <clears throat> and that's terrific. And a lot of that is newer people who come in town who are more demanding, perhaps, of, of certain things. However, going along with that is uh, the prices of some of these houses. Um, and so their taxes are enormous, and they don't want to pay the taxes. So it's, you know, it's kind of a catch-22 thing. Um, I still look at our taxes. I mean, of course, we're underneath the median aid here. But um, I consider everything we get for our taxes absolutely incredible, really. Mm -hmm. um, I don't begrudge the schools anything. My kids all went through the schools. These are the kids who are hopefully, knock on wood, going to support us in our old age. Knock on wood, if there is Social Security left. Um, the roads are better, and more of them. Uh, the thing I don't like is that most of the people in the town hall don't live here anymore. They don't, oh, okay. they don't know the community. Um, I think Norman's getting to know the community, but um, there's no history. And I think that's to the detriment of the town. Um, and now they're even talking about perhaps uh, going outside town for the police chief. We've always had it in town because these are the guys who know everybody, who know everything, know the systems, and it's. Um, so I think that's I think that's been a detriment. I mean, I know that Norman wants to hire his own people and all, but I really wish he would have looked closer to home in Hopkinton, mm -hmm. because I I can't explain the feeling when you go into town hall now. You don't know anybody. It's really weird because for 37 years I've known everybody. 
way back with uh, Al Paradise and um, Sandy, Sally Ann McIntosh and Bill Key for Selectment when I moved in. So it's, it's... I'm amazed at how you can just rattle names off. I love that. <laughs> I'm amazed I can remember them. <laughs> oh, shut up! Bob! Are you gonna edit That's all that? Man. You gonna edit all that barking no. out of there? This is how we sit in Sarah's backyard. <laughs> well, years and years ago, when those trees weren't there or were very little, we had a garden, big, huge veggie garden out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, the trees got big. The garden never got any sun. So Frank wanted a swimming pool. You told me that was his yeah, midlife crisis. Yes, his midlife crisis, his 19-year-old bimbo in his little red sports car, is the swimming pool. Um, although it's it's been terrific. I mean, our kids were in it. All the neighborhood kids come in it, and it, it's fun. It just it pulls the neighborhood together. Um, and we have a small, small garden <laughs> off to the side of the end of the pool now. Um, Do you know what kind of <clears throat> land this used to be? Um, was it always... You know, like a neighborhood or, or oh yeah, I think it was. It, these were mill houses. Okay. Yeah. Um. They the who were they? Gorham Arms. All right. We we've been here thirty seven years. We bought the house from Eddie Deanna, who'd been here five years. Hello, ladies. <laughs> hey, John. All right. I'll see that thing. Usually just leave it on. All right. Can you think of any other story you want to share? I forgot where we were. Oh, the mill houses. These were all mill Oh, houses. yeah. And, uh, well, anyway, I was telling you the years that we'd been here. Blah, blah. When we moved in here, this was always referred to as the Gorham Arms House. Hmm. Even though uh, there are still old-timers in town who will still call it the Gorham Arms House. Even though we have been here 37 years. And they used to have horses. Hmm. And uh, they used to, you know, have this whole property up there where they, ran, they rode and all. Were there horses when you moved in? No. Okay. No, but you know, one of his daughters came by. Oh, I don't know, maybe ten years ago. Jeannie, Jeannie Arms came by, and she's the one who had the horse. She knocked on the door and said, "I'm Jeannie Arms. Can I come in and see what you've done with the old house?" And it was so much fun. She just had such a kick mm. coming in, looking all around. Did she tell you a little bit about stuff before about the house, or? Just well, she was, basically, she came in and said, Oh, thank God you got rid of all that paneling <laughs> and that ugly green linoleum floor in the kitchen. <laughs> I like the way... Well, no, she came in after the addition, uh -huh. uh, which we put on when Frank's mother came to live with us. But uh, So she really liked that. It was, uh, <laughs> that was fun. That was really fun. <laughs> I've kind of wanted to do that to the house I grew up in in Newton. Oh, yeah. But I'm nervous <laughs> to go and knock on some stranger's door. Hey, I used to live here when I was a kid. <laughs> I would assume that people would be excited to come in. I would love for somebody to come by and check out my house. Be like, come here, look what I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Look what we're still doing. Oh. Lucini ladies, right? That's Lucinis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the kids' paper route. All up and down here, Ash, not not Ash, um, Holt, Pike, Eastview. First, Brendan had the paper route. Then Amy had the paper route very briefly because she didn't like to work. Then Mark had the paper route. And so they all started earning money at a, a good age, and they had savings accounts. And, and now they print the paper in the morning and have some guy deliver it or not deliver it because I didn't get Sunday's paper <laughs> but I don't know dude what else would you like to know I think that's good unless you can think of any I really wanted to get the story of the of how you started the paper oh documented okay, mm -hmm. okay. I think that's important to know. actually I think Jane winter wrote a story in the in a after five years she interviewed me down at Brown and Smith's oh did she I don't know if it was Brown. It wasn't Brown and Smith anyway. Um, but it's out there somewhere in the barn in a box. Huh. Might have to dig through there one of those days. Oh, God. 
You don't want to do that. <laughs> Some of them are in, the, are in the loft, but most of it's... Frank keeps hoping that we'll have a really big storm and the barn will fall down. We've got 14 years of history in this little barn. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. I think... But you know, they really built that little barn. <laughs> he wants it to fall down so he can build a pool house. <laughs> However, I don't think it's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. Hurricane Gloria, Hurricane Sandy, a blizzard of 78. <laughs> it's still standing. Yep. Okay. Needs another coat of paint, but I don't even know if it's worth it. <laughs> well, with that, now I have to close. Okay. okay. Again, this is Erica Brown. It's April 30th. 2013, and I'm interviewing Sarah Duckett, who lives on Fenton Street. Thank you.